<laughs> Good evening. How y'all doing today? Let's pray real quick. I want to say thank you on behalf of our leadership, our pastor, Ms. Anna and Josiah. We thank you for all the new faces, all the visitors came, the people on Facebook Live. We thank you for your support. You know what? We must be doing something great. You know, when, we, when, we, when you get persecuted, that means that the devil's angry, amen? So we're, we're, it's a blessing to be here. It's an honor to be here and be used by God, okay? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the day. We give you all the honor and all the glory. God, I ask that you begin to speak to our hearts, God. Begin to renew our minds, God. And I pray that your word begin to just land on fertile ground today, God. And I pray that your word begin to shake the foundations of hell, God. And we begin to just take control of our lives through you, God, and your Holy Spirit, God. They came to hear from you, not from a man, God. So I ask that your Holy Spirit speak through me with no help from me, God. I pray that you go before me and around me. And I pray that you put a hedge of protection around this this ministry, this church, these men's home, the women's home, the church members, every matrimony in here, every kid in here, God. God, we give you honor and glory, God, for the great things that you do through us, God. And we ask that you help us, God, fulfill that commission, God, to go out to the highways and the byways, God, and bring in to bring people to see you and to build the body of Christ up together, God. And we thank you for the great responsibility you poured out upon us, God, and we thank you because you're mindful of us every day, God, and we thank you because you're rich in mercy and your grace, God, and you're extremely patient, God, with a stubborn nation like us, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, man. Today's title is going to be called The Great Letdown. You can be seated. The Great, Let, the great Letdown. I know we're, we're away from the parables, but that was my parable to share, and I wanted to share it because it, it's, it's a, there's a lesson in there in that parable about the rich young ruler, about his condition that he had, that had to be exposed, right? And a lot of times we come to Christ and we're seeking Christ, but the condition and the motive and the, 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 that has to be exposed, and God can expose it through, through his word and through his presence and through the Holy Spirit. So we're going to read. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 10 all the way to, from 17 to 31. And then we're going to jump into it, amen? It said, and as he was sitting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Then he, then he checks him and says, You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, or honor your father and mother. And in verse 20 he said, and then he, the, the rich ruler says, and he said to, the, to, said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And you know when somebody speaks to you in love, they can say something to you that's in truth that's going to hurt you and offend you, but they're saying it because they love you. Right, so Jesus looked at him and, and loved this young man, and he told him, he said, you lack one thing. Because like, like this rich young ruler, a lot of us think that we have everything in check. We live our life by a checkbox, a to-do list. And that's what this rich young ruler was doing. He lived his life with a to-do list, and he checked them all as he was going. But when he came to Jesus, Jesus said, you lack one thing. And today, Jesus is going to tell us the same thing. He said, you lack one thing. He said, go, uh, go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it would be, it will be, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. 24, and he said, and the disciples were amazed at, the, at, the, at his words, but Jesus said to him again, said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. He said, is it easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God? And they were, they were exceedingly astonished, and they said to him, then who can be saved? Right, because Jesus gives some harsh conditions. Either we're all in or we're not in at all. And it says, Jesus looked at him and said, looked at them and said, with, this, with, a man, with man it's impossible, but with God, for all things are possible with God. And then Peter began to say to him, 
See, we have left everything and followed you. But then Jesus, Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now, now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. That's got to be in there. And, and in the ages to come, eternal life, but many but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Amen? Right, so it's generally said, and it's true, that things are easier for the wealthy and for the rich and famous. Right? It's always said it was easy because you have money. It was easy because you paid your way there. It was easy because you opened doors with your money. Why? Why? Because money opens doors and attracts certain type of people. <laughs> And for example, money can get us the best, of, the best education, right or wrong. You don't even have to pass your, your, all your college degrees, but if you got money, you're going to get the best education. You're going to get the best health care. The best health care. You're not going to get Obamacare. You're going to get the best. <laughs> you're going to get the best health care, the best places on earth. You're going to be able to travel and see and walk on them. You're going to be able to eat the best foods, Mexican food, amen, pleasures of life. I had to throw that in there. <laughs> you're going to get the, the pleasures of life with all the money, right? Plastic surgery. If you're, not, if you're not satisfied with the way you look, you can go to the doctor and tell them to put a little plastic on you. Take here off, take this off, take this off, put this on. You know how we are. So you get the best plastic surgery in almost every area of our lives. <laughs> and, even, and if you have enough money, you can even try to change your gender. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and people are trying it nowadays. They ain't satisfied with who God made them for. And so they want to go from man to woman or from woman to man. Well, I feel like a woman trapped in a man's body. <laughs> but who knows? But you, who, how many of us know that God knows our true identity? No matter how hard you try to change it, no matter how hard you try to fight against how God created you, God knows who you really are. You can go from Fred to Frida, but God knows you're still Fred. Amen. Because we went to California, and, we went, and it was some wicked people out there. My God. I would tell you if I wasn't at church. But God knows our true identity. And a lot of us try to hide behind our possessions, behind our status, behind our job, behind our, our wisdom, behind what we have. We try to hide it, and then when we, when we, if we have more than others, then we judge others with the things that we have. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're admitting it, man. This is why we can say this, that money is the universal pass the passport of the day. If you have money, you can go anywhere. If you have money, anybody accepts you. If you say, don't worry about it, I'm going to pay for it, what are you going to say? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but you ain't going to be accepted if somebody else got to pay for you. They're going to say, don't invite George, you ain't never got no money. But you got appetite, you know what I mean? They might not got no money, but if you take me out to eat, I'll make you laugh. Amen. Amen. So we can say that money is a universal passport to anything. It opens doors that, that shouldn't be opened. But here in this encounter, we discover that, that there's one door that money cannot open and couldn't open for this young rich ruler. The, the door of salvation. Because in the Bible, I think it's in the book of Isaiah, it says that our, that our deeds are like filthy garments. See, anything that we do on our own strength, and when we try to get to Jesus in our own strength, God doesn't honor it because we're doing it in our own strength, not in what he's telling you to do. Because when we begin to do things in our own strength, we begin to follow Jesus and search after Jesus that what we think is correct, not the way the Bible says and the Holy Spirit convicts you as.
And I think this, and because how many of us know that the rich and those trying to keep up with the Kardashians, because you know, you know the Kenners, he was an Olympian champion, now he wants to be a supermodel. <laughs> so because how many of us know that the rich and those trying to keep up with the Kardashians seek eternal life and materialistic pleasures? That's why some people don't go to church because they'd rather chase the overtime instead of chasing God and chasing eternal life and chasing the real peace that they need. They're looking for materialistic pleasures, not depending and trusting that God is going to provide for them. And so they search for it in materialistic pleasures. They search for it in being comfortable. That's why many people want to work and have money because they want to set their life up in comfortability. And let me tell you, comfortability means you mean you stop growing and you're content with what you have. You're not growing anymore. And in Christianity, if you don't grow, you're dying. You got to learn something new every day as a Christian. And so we're seeking it being comfortable. And some of us seek it looking at plastic surgery. Just be happy with the way God made you. That's why I'm, I, I, I'm, I'd be glad when, when some of these ugly dudes get some of these beautiful women because they're comfortable in who they are. <laughs> all you gym rats are mad right now. It'll be all right. They see it in Botox. You know, they be getting shots in their forehead. They don't want wrinkles up there. Wrinkles in their eyes, wrinkles in their lips, around their mouth. But they won't stay up late and stop going to the bar where the wrinkles are coming from or fighting and stressing over money or bills. They don't let, they just do that and depend on Jesus. Jesus will give them youth. <laughs> but they'd rather go pay if I'm going to inject them in the face and then they're walking around swollen and looking like a bunch of catfish. They put some lipstick on some catfish, and that's how they look. Because <laughs> they got all that lotion, huh? <laughs> you know how when you get a catfish out, and it's slimy, and it's all shiny? <laughs> they look for them Botox and hair plugs. They go to L.A., and they go to other places. They go to other cities, other countries to go get hair plugs put in. They don't even know whose hair they put on them. <laughs> but you're there, yeah, 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 hook me up. Look for it in hair plugs, and, and for some of us, we look for it in fortune tellers. Can you please tell me my fortune? Can you tell me my future? Can you tell me who I'm going to marry? How many kids are going to be? How, am I going to be happy? Well, if you ain't happy now, what makes you think you'll be happy later? <laughs> Mexicans are good with fortune tellers. <laughs> my grandpa used to be one. He used to sweep me with leaves and eggs and all kinds of stuff. That stuff didn't work. <laughs> Blow smoke in my face. Then he tell my mom, no, me con este, mija, te la rayaste. Then palm readers. Read my palm, please. When am I destined to get married? And then they tell you that you're destined to get married in 10 years. That's too long. I need to get married now. Now you want to tell the palm reader that he did that wrong. <laughs> In horoscopes, how many of you read your horoscope every day? Oh, I'm a Capricorn, and it says that my <laughs> I'm compatible with a rabbit. <laughs> Reading horoscopes and put them on your Facebook and Tattooing them on yourself, don't know what it really means, and getting Chinese tattoos and Hebrew tattoos. You don't speak now language of it. <laughs> and for us old folks, you go you used, you used to read Ann Landers. She been <laughs> she'd been a columnist for over 40 years, and she would give advice to people, Ann Landers. And you wouldn't go nowhere until you read your Ann Landers advice for the day. And stay away from angry people. And you're like, oh, no, how am I going to stay away from myself? <laughs> you you want to use lotions and creams, and you pay all kinds of money for lotion that they found somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea. 
that scraped it from the bottom of the ocean, and it's going to take all the wrinkles away, and it's going to give you a new glow. All it does is dry your skin up. And the only reason you're glowing because you got a whole bunch of lotion on. People spend their time looking for the fountain of youth. People want to go to Jerusalem and, and find the pool that the blind man or the crippled man was jumped in and thrown in. I want to jump in that same pool. Maybe I get healed from my deception. Because <laughs> money is deceiving. Money gives us temporary peace, temporary joy, temporary relationships. Because, you know, when, we, we, when we're dating, we're giving the world. When we're married, we're, we're broke. <laughs> the real you comes out when you're married. Well, I just did it because we were dating, you know what I mean? Go ahead and cook some eggs and beans. Meaning we, do, we try to get salvation through through works and our own strength, the sad part about it that those who are trying to keep up with the Kardashians are seeking approval and acceptance from people who don't even know you. We're trying to keep up with word and traditions when we should be keeping up with the church, with the God, what he's saying, not what the world is saying. That's why many churches go through troubles, go through ups and downs, because they want to invite the traditional things of the world into the church when God says it's not about tradition, it's about a relationship. And I'm going to tell you, I was telling this morning, if this relationship is not good, these relationships you have here will never be good. It's a process that the world doesn't want to go through. What we see here is a young rich ruler trying to butter up Jesus. Good teacher. But Jesus knowing saw right through it. And hit him with the truth. He said, why do you call me good when only God is the good one? And then he says, just like when we come to Jesus half-hearted and still entangled in our secret sin. Because many of us have a secret sin that we pet every day and then we play with it every day. The sin of quitting, the sin of cheating, the sin of committing adultery, the sin of, of playing and joking like the world plays and jokes. The sin of trying to seek the approval of the people that work with you. It's just like when Peter said in this encounter, said, I won't leave you. But what happened to Peter later on? Jesus had to rebuke him, say, get behind me, Satan. And then he told him, you're going to deny me three times. He said, no, I won't, Jesus. I'll never deny you. I'll die with you when the time came, you know. How are you coming to Jesus today? How are you coming to the altar? Because see, the altar is for me and you to come to Jesus and come to God and say, you know what? I've been wrong and you're right. Please help me see it. I need your help. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I want to quit and I don't want to, but I don't know how else to keep going. We used to look like fools in the bar, but we don't want to look like fools for Jesus. You know, those Latinos used to walk in the bar and you're sure to be on button all the way to here and you had a big medallion. <laughs> Thought you looked cool. One of them toggle hats. <laughs> but it's like when Jesus, Jesus when, when he spoke on the, on, on the parable of, of the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector, that's how some of us come to Jesus. Oh, thank you, God, I'm not like so-and-so, God. Thank you, God, that I pay my tithes and I work and I have a job and my bills are always on, God. Thank you, God. I'm not like that lazy neighbor of mine. But why don't you go and witness to your lazy neighbor and show them how you got what you got? <laughs> we come in with self-righteousness. Our possessions make us identify us. We seek our identity through what we have. But when Jesus checked him, Jesus, Jesus told him, you know the commandments. He said, you know what to do. Jesus don't want to do them. You're seeking salvation through the loophole. 
Because in James 4, 17, it says, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. He knew what to do. He just didn't want to do it because his possessions meant more to him than salvation. He was trying to buy his way into heaven. And you can't buy your way into heaven. That price has already been paid by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary when he shed his blood. You've been redeemed. There's no other way you can redeem yourself. But it's, it's crazy because you have to remember this, this young man was a young, rich ruler. In those days, those, the kings were educated. They were, they, were, they were very educated. So he had to know what Jesus was teaching. He probably even sat in one of the synagogues where Jesus taught for him to chase him before he left Jericho. Because it was important because that was going to be the last time that Jesus went through Jericho. That's why the blind Bartimaeus cried out and cried out because that was the last time Jesus was going to Jericho. This might be the last time that Jesus comes through here, so we better start crying out completely to God. But we got the manana mentality. So he, he probably sat, in the, he sat down in the synagogue where, teach, where Jesus taught us a couple of times. And, and like many of us, he sat there with a look on his face of disagreement. Of disagreeing with what Jesus was saying. That he, when he would say that I am the truth, the life, and the only way to God. He probably disagreed with it. Because he wanted to live the way he wanted to live and still be called a Christian. Some of us want to live the way we want to live and still be noticed as a Christian. <laughs> Too quiet, huh? Because a lot of us sit in the house of God with a look on our face like, man, if he says something else, I'm going to get him out of the church. <laughs> I hate that guy. So he probably sat there too with, a, with talking about, I wish you would, Jesus. I wish you would. And Jesus did. <laughs> Jesus will challenge you. Jesus challenged this young man, but the challenge that Jesus gave him exposed his heart and his condition that he was covetous and that he valued what he had and he wasn't going to give it up. What are you holding on to that you don't want to give up to Jesus? <laughs> See, the young rich ruler found his, no, well, let me say something before I keep going, God, I'm going to jump ahead of myself. It says, in Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are we treasuring today? What are we really chasing today? The young rich ruler found his identity in his wealth. And he found his comfort, his power, his status, his authority, etc., his education, his wisdom, his pool that he had. Because he was a young rich ruler. He wasn't, they didn't say he was a king, but he had somebody else had to be ruler over him. It's maybe his daddy. And he probably trying to use his daddy's power and authority to choose and move things around. That's why we tell you like this, because your dad or your mom was a pastor or because they've been saved for so many long doesn't mean you're saved. Salvation is a personal encounter. <laughs> it's not because my daddy was a pastor and now I'm saved. It don't work that way. My mom been saved for over 40 years and I lived like the devil. For 20 of them. He was called a, a ruler, and the Greek word refers to a leader, an official of some sort, some, with some administrative authority. So in Greek, he had authority. He was a leader. He was considered a man of statue, a man that was well-respected. So when Jesus challenged him and he walked away discouraged, imagine all those who respected this man and all those who followed this man and all those who fell under his authority, how they must have felt. See, in those times, it was unlikely for the Romans or the Greeks to approach Jesus with any, with any religious questions because they didn't believe in what Jesus was teaching. The Romans adopted the Greek mythology and the Greek philosophy and the Greek beliefs and the Greek gods. That's why it said, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's why they, they, that's why they, paid, they paid tithes to Caesar and not to God. 
See, they would, the Romans and Greeks would never come and ask Jesus any questions. But something had been pricking at this young man's heart was the truth and the love that Jesus had. So the young rich ruler was probably a Jewish leader in local synagogues or a member of the Sahedrin or the Jewish court that dealt with religious issues in Jesus' days. <laughs> See, the gods of the, uh, the, and the goddess of the Greek culture significantly, significantly influenced the development of Roman deities. What's influencing you? What worldly trend has you so captivated? What's influencing you today? Are you letting the world influence the way you serve God, the way you worship God, the way you see God, the way you honor God? They adopted all these false gods in Rome. You had Greeks, barbarians, Romans, all kind of people there. So the question reveals a couple of things of this young rich ruler. It tells us he must have felt something missing in his spiritual life. As, as we will see, that he believes he has something. He's been scrumptiously faithful. He believes he's been truly faithful. See, there's no way that me and you can work to be faithful. Some of us work so you don't see the real condition of who you are. Some of us work so you don't go home to, the, you say, a nagging house. And you'll work overtime, and you'll stay late, and you won't come home until all the babies are asleep because you don't want to deal with it. But you're making an excuse, I'm working so we can get ahead, honey. He thought it was favorable because he kept the commandments. But his sense, his sense is that he, that he, that he was alone. There's some of us here today that feel alone, that feel trapped, and don't know how to get out of that. And the more you try, the more you put on yourself, and the more overwhelmed you become. The second thing they revealed is that it tells us he believes that, that gaining eternal life depends on what he does. See, it doesn't depend on how loud you are or how you jump. It depends on the condition of our heart and how much you love that word goes inside of us and begins to develop us and begin to destroy this heart, a heart of mine. Because see, every week, every Sunday you come here, something has hit your heart to harden a little bit. And you got to come to God open. Salvation is something you, you, you can earn or deserve based on actions of what he thought. I can earn my way to heaven. But if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that the same two things are also true about most of us. We all tend to believe that we have to be good in order to be saved. We feel that, that we are never good enough. That something is always lacking. Sometimes you feel like you, you, when you want to when you want to accept other people, you don't want to be too harsh of a Christian because you think love is too hard, so you begin to compromise in your walk. Compromise in your house. Compromise in your relationship. Compromise of what you give to God. But if we're being honest, we all feel like we have to do something. Not to appease God, but to appease ourselves. Not to make God feel better, but to make ourselves feel better. So we'll work and we'll serve and we'll go and we'll go, but not to please God, but to make yourself feel good about you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9 say this, but God being rich in mercy... That's so awesome right there. But God being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated up with him in the, in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God and not a result of works, 
so that no one may boast. <laughs> I got to tell the home, we're not preaching salvation by works. Works comes because you're grateful. Work comes because you, you honor what God is giving you. It's not salvation by works, never by works. It's by grace and who you have faith in. And your faith better be on the cross of Calvary and Jesus and what he did on the, on the cross, how he shed his blood. The minute he shed his blood and the minute he ascended to heaven, that's the minute his righteousness was imputated into me and you. I can teach you with all these biblical terms, but I might lose you, so we keep it simple. Maybe the young rich ruler wanted something to brag about. Well, look what I did. Look how God used me. Oh, look how I preach. People laugh when I preach. People smile. People joke. People cry. Ooh. And who doesn't want something to boast about? The second thing, the second thing the quest for salvation reveals to us about the rich young ruler is the condition of his heart. He was covetous. Meaning he wanted stuff he already had. He wanted more. How am I going to let go of what I have? I, I worked hard for it, Jesus. Praise and worship team, come on, I'm about to close out. Having or showing great desire to possess something belonging to someone else. That's what covetous means. It means you're having or showing a great desire to possess something belonging to someone else. He saw something in Jesus. People saw something in Jesus as he walked, as he was on his way to, to the cross of Calvary, on his way to Google. People saw the peace and the love and the hope and the salvation that he was walking in. So people wanted it. They just didn't know how to get there. So when this young rich ruler saw Jesus, he knew he had, he had something that he didn't have. So he went after it. But when Jesus uncovered him, he was saddened. But it wasn't Jesus' intention to sadden him. It was Jesus' intention to let go and follow him completely. See, Jesus doesn't want to sadden you. Jesus wants to tell us the truth of what we're lacking in him. And sometimes we lack trust. We lack faith. We lack steadfast. We lack peace. We lack joy. We lack love. We lack self-control. And Jesus is telling you today, if you just come to me, all those who are heavy and weary laden, and I will give you rest and you will find rest for your souls. Take on my yoke because my yoke is light. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. You got to stop wanting what the world has to start wanting what God has is that peace that you're looking for. The peace to give you the strength to walk through that valley of shadow of death with no fear. The, the, the fear that, that captivates you. You got to be like an Ezekiel. You got to tell God, make these dry bones alive, Jesus. Make me alive again, Jesus. Man, Jesus wants to give you life in abundance. It says that he's rich in his mercy, rich in his grace. <laughs> and I know some of us here are dry. But just like an Ezekiel... He's asking you, can those dry bones live again? And I believe they can. And I believe they will. You can stand up, church. The altar is open. Amen. Don't get scared of nobody shooting outside. The altar is open. And nobody's going to force you to come. But I know each and one of us know there's areas in our life that are dry. That need to be reborn and be regenerated. Your heart needs to be put back in, in, in the right condition. Because we fall. the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. But God is saying, I am my rich and in my mercy. When, when, even when we were in our transgressions, he said, I died for you. Romans 5, 8 says, yet while you were yet sinners, he died for me and you on the cross. I believe when he saw Jesus... He not only saw what he didn't have, but he felt in his heart and he felt the emptiness that, had been seeking, that he'd been seeking to fill, but didn't know how. 
So he filled, it, he filled it the best way he knew how, through possessions that he could have control over. See, a lot of you want to control your life, but it's not about controlling your life. It's about surrendering your life. <laughs> I believe there are many people seeking to fill a void in their hearts today. Right here in this church, we've been trying to fill it with works compromising with feel-good methods, rushing into relationships, and some by just keeping silent about your true condition. I believe we've been coming to Jesus with the wrong questions. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins are red as scarlet, he said, I know your condition. I know your sinful heart. Come to me anyway, because I'm your heavenly father. And in Hebrews, Hebrews it says, approach the throne of grace with boldness. He said, they will be, with, they will be white as snow, so that the, the red is, they're, like, they're red like crimson. They will be like wool. Verse 19 says, if you, if you consent and obey, you will, you will eat the best of the land. Verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And I know there's a lot of us here today seeking salvation, seeking purpose. And God is here today and he wants to give you that. He wants to give you peace about, your, about where you're at today. He wants to give you comfort. He's here waiting on you with open arms, church. Father, we are here today, God, and we're searching, God. And we're looking, God, to come to you, God, with an open heart, God. Let our hearts be open, God. Let our minds be open. Let your word begin to just pierce our hearts today, God. Let your word begin to show us what we're lacking at, God. Help me walk towards you, God. Help me hold on, God. Help me be faithful, God. Help me be steadfast, God. Help me be the man you call me to be, God. Teach me to love the way you love, God. God, open my eyes to your truth today, God, because I'm tired of failing you, God. But I know that this church is your church, God. And I pray for every marriage in this place, God, or every kid in this place, or every man and woman in here, God. I pray that their hearts, God, be filled with your joy and your peace, God. I pray that you bless their households, God. I pray that you bless their hands and their feet, and you give them the word to speak to the lost, God, that we fulfill the great commission you've given us, God. So awesome you are, God. So wonderful you are, God. So beautiful you are, God. So amazing you are, God. I welcome you into my life, God, and into my heart, God. And I welcome you into my family's life, God. I pray, God, that you begin to knock down any idols into my life, God, that I would come to you empty-handed, God, and broken the way you found me, God. Thank you, God, for using what you, who you use today, God. Your word says that you use the, the base things of the world, God. Thank you, Jesus. So amazing, Jesus.